Well, the April jobs report came out earlier this morning, showing that 175,000 jobs were added last month as unemployment took a little bit higher to 3.9 percent. Well, joining me now with more is chief economist at EY, Gregory Daco. Uh, Gregory, thanks so much for joining. And what's your takeaway from the April jobs report? I think what this report shows is that the labor market is finally see, finally balancing out, and that's a very good thing. Yes, the payroll print was a little bit lower than consensus expectations, but we've been warning for some time now that there is an underlying slowdown in labor market demand. That slowdown is coming with disinflationary forces, which is exactly what we want. So the combo of seeing more moderate but sustainable pace of job growth along with easing Wage growth momentum is the ideal combo when it comes to getting back to that 2% inflation target that Fed policymakers want to achieve. Uh, so, Gregory, I want to get your take on the Fed decision and comments from the Fed chair earlier this week as well, uh, because these jobs numbers impact that, and you are an economist. Uh, do you think the Fed is progressing at the proper tone here, uh, given that we are seeing some easing, but technically inflation is still a little bit higher than its 2% target? I think, generally speaking, policymakers have been a little bit excessively data dependent. Uh, and that's been a bit of a concern over the course of the last few months because we've seen a lot of noise in economic data. Now we have Fetcher Powell that has offered three potential paths in terms of monetary policy. The first path is that if inflation continues to move towards the 2% target, the Fed will be easing monetary policy this year. The second path is if there is a sudden and marked slowdown in the labor market that would also prompt the Fed to start easing monetary policy. The third path, which is one in which inflation remains more persistent, is one in which the Fed would hold monetary policy constant. That type of framework is ideal to understand how the Fed will be reacting. We continue to believe that the Fed will be easing monetary policy starting in July with two rate cuts over the back end of this year that will be much less than what was expected a few months ago, but more than what is currently priced into markets. Uh, interesting. And so given that, uh, Gregory, how do you think this economy can progress uh, knowing what we know? Well, I think the, the key challenge for the economy is really to achieve that soft landing, right? What we want is an environment in which the economy is progressing at a sustainable pace where inflationary pressures are not excessively high, and that is a pace in which job growth is closer to 180,000 jobs per month to 200,000 jobs per month than it is to 300,000 jobs per month. It is also an environment in which you continue to see this disinflationary momentum that allows the Fed to gradually ease interest rates, cut interest rates, and bring the cost of capital somewhat lower to favor more sustainable investment. That is the type of economy we're after in terms of a sustainable pace of growth mm -hmm. driven by stronger productivity momentum as well as a solid and robust labor market. What are you seeing on a sector by sector basis within the jobs report uh, that we got in April? I think one of the interesting elements in the jobs report in April was that we continue to see the healthcare sector, which has been structurally constrained, continue to drive a majority of the gains on the labor market front. About half of the private sector job gains came from the healthcare sector. But we also saw other sectors benefit from strong momentum. The retail sector is still adding jobs. Transportation uh, employment was also strong. We did see some weakness, a little bit more weakness in the construction sector and manufacturing sector and also on the professional and businesses services front. But overall, this appears, again, to be a more balanced environment when it comes to job growth, where we're seeing more evenness across the different sectors, which is a big plus if you want to have a sustainable labor market. Mm -hmm. It's one where there is more balance. Uh, well, we did see the unemployment rate, I believe, tick up a hair to 3.9%. Should investors be concerned about that? There's always that fear of the unemployment rate really rising very strongly. What we've seen so far is that for the last 27 months, we've had the unemployment rate stay below 4%. That's the longest stretch below 4% since 1969, so a long time ago. We still have a robust labor market. An unemployment rate under 4% with 
a participation rate, which is an indicator of how many people are participating in the labor market, a participation rate that is at a post-pandemic high, that combo is still indicative of a solid labor market. And let's not forget, if you dig deeper into participation in the U.S. labor market, you'll see that prime age labor force participation is, it has a, is at a 20-year high, and you're also seeing more women participate in the labor force, which is a very positive thing driving sustainable growth. Uh -huh. How have you seen the consumer respond in this environment? We know that the bulk of GDP is driven by consumer spending. Yes. Yes, it is. And we have about 70% of the U.S. economy that is essentially driven by consumer spending. What we're starting to see is a bit of a slowdown, a bit of a cool down in disposable income momentum. That is generally reflective of both job growth and wage growth. And we're seeing both, as we just discussed, starting to slow. Nothing major, nothing alarming, but we are seeing job growth gradually slow. We're also seeing wage growth momentum gradually slow. That's feeding into more moderate disposable income growth momentum, which in turn is forcing consumers to add a little bit more discretion in terms of their spending pattern. So we're not seeing any type of retrenchment, but we are seeing more scrutiny on the part of consumers as to how much they buy, being much more careful and attentive to the pricing environment and more susceptible to mm -hmm. pull back if pricing is too strong, too elevated uh, for their liking. Uh, since we broadcast this show from the Stock Exchange, we talk a lot about you know what all this news does mean for investors, but I do want to drill down more into what it means for Americans. Uh, obviously, as they are the active component of this economy, for anyone uh, who might be considering uh, switching jobs, looking for a, a job right now, or worried about the health of their current job, what would you tell them in the wake of this report? Well, I would tell them that we are in an environment where the value of talent has shifted quite dramatically from the pre-pandemic era. You're seeing employers value talent much more than they did before the pandemic. And that is one of the key reasons why we have conditions in the labor market that are as they are today. The slowdown that we've seen in labor market demand has not been translated into broad-based layoffs, as has been the case in prior cycles. Instead, what you're seeing is a reduction in hiring. There is less hiring going on. There's also less quitting going on in this labor market, so much less churn than there was a few years ago. That is a labor market that is still robust but where you have to really think twice about making that shift. Is it really worth it? Um, are you going to find an opportunity that is as good or better? Or are you better to stay in your current role and take advantage of the current benefits that you have and the current training programs? Because a lot of employers are focused on training their workforce and achieving stronger productivity growth in this high cost environment. I would be curious to get your take, Gregory, in terms of you know ways that workers uh, should be upskilling, should be training themselves. Are there specific skills uh, that you are seeing in high demand? Yeah, I think what we're seeing is really being able to address the needs of the employers. Uh, increasingly, there is that focus on the side of employers to drive stronger productivity, more efficient processes in this environment where, let's not forget, yes, inflation has come down, but cost levels remain elevated, whether it's wages or the cost of inputs everything is much more expensive than it was before the pandemic. So there are uh, a number of employers that we talk to that are really looking for these employees that have the right set of skills to address uh, the specific needs of each and every company. And that is really where employees have to think about what are the optimal mix of skills that I can bring to my employer and to drive that producti productivity forward, not just drive the employment forward, but really make it as efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got this, we've got the first quarter GDP report in the books. Uh, we heard from the Fed earlier this week. Now we've got this jobs report. What are you expecting over the course of these summer months, uh, Gregory, in terms of how the economy might fare and what we could see in the data? Well, first off, I, I want to highlight the fact that the GDP print was soft. The headline print of 1.6% growth in the first quarter did not really indicate the true underlying pace of the economy. The reason being that imports were very strong and imports detract from GDP growth. But these imports were driven by still resilient domestic demand. So we still have an environment where economic momentum in the first quarter of this year was still relatively resilient. 
I would say the underlying pace of growth is around that 2.5% mark, which is still very good. As we navigate through the summer and through the rest of the year, you're going to see more scrutiny on the part of consumers and businesses in this high cost environment. On the part of consumers, lower income families are showing signs of being a little bit more cautious with their outlays. You still have higher income families that are still spending and businesses are really waiting for that lower interest rate environment to make those investments. So there is scrutiny also on the side of businesses when it comes to investments. But we are still positive in terms of the overall trajectory of the U.S. economy. We still expect growth this year to average about 2.5% and move into 2025 at this sustainable 2% pace. So this is still a strong economy and one in which a lower cost of capital environment should continue to drive that sustainable pace of growth into 2025 and also drive stronger deal market activity as we navigate into next year. All right, Gregory Daco, Chief Economist at EY. Uh, Gregory, thanks so much for your time, especially on a busy uh, jobs report morning.